And it was the sale that I was thinking of when I was putting together the material to talk about. And uh, uh, the task that I was given was, you know, talk about some things that are coming along, some new changes, uh, uh, what's going to be happening. And I was thinking of them in the, in the sense of, uh, is it going to be surprising? And I said, oh, geez, I don't want anything surprising. You're going to go to a sale. You don't, want, you don't want to be surprised by anything. You want to feel very comfortable in the knowledge that you have and uh, confidence to uh, take this genetic, this genomic revolution one, one step further and spend money and, and buy high genetics and reproduce high genetics and create new genetics. So <clears throat> a lot of the things that I want to say are updates, but I want them to be comforting updates. And uh, that's, that, that was the task that I gave myself. So in talking about the uh, breeding of uh, genetics, um, I do want to touch upon the science. Uh, everybody is excited about the, the science and what we are learning and, and uh, uh, what are the updates. So are there some big surprises coming along as we learn more? Are there new genes? George talked a little bit about that. If there's new genes that are being discovered, are there new families that are cover carrying those genes and uh, how do we find them and, and should we be uh, interested in discovering them and how do we discover them? Uh, George also mentioned the uh, changes in the uh, genetic evaluations. Um, he didn't say too, too much. <laughs> so uh, I figured I, I, I needed to explain the changes in the genetic evaluations that are coming along because I know how violent you can get when the surprises come along and you say, I never heard about that. So <clears throat> I will at least mention it and try to explain uh, uh, what is coming down the pike. And also uh, about um, thinking about the future, planning for the future, investing in the future. It's always good to know uh, what at least one person's view of, of how the uh, traits of importance, the goals, breeding goals, uh, will be changing. And I do want to talk about uh, TPI. Um, we should, if I got a dollar for every time that the TPI was mentioned, I think I could uh, purchase an animal. So um, I have a, a, a bull. Uh, I'm going to give an example. It's uh, the bull hill. And uh, the reason why he's selected, I guess he's a little bit old genetics now, but I, I um, give some lectures at uh, local universities. And uh, I go and I talk to the students and I explain how what they're learning, the science that they're learning does have a practical application in uh, genomic predictions, genomic selection. And uh, so a, a bowl that I use is this bowl hill, uh, a Vermont bred bull, so since I'm talking to local universities, uh, this is the bull that I uh, frequently uh, or have used in the past. And as I um, explain to them how the science that they are learning has a practical application, what I'm hoping to do in this part is to talk to you about you knowing very well the practical applications and kind of go backwards and, and show you the science that's behind uh, the genomic predictions and uh, build your confidence as you see the science relate with the, uh, the actual information. So we saw this bowl and, and we would give the, the numbers, everybody remembers we just put out uh, net merit, TPI, PTA type, you know, the individual traits, and for many, many years that was essentially all we put out. We would put out that number, a reliability value, number of daughters, number of herds. And really the genomics is uh, just trying to dig a little bit deeper into where this, uh, where the genetic information is coming from. So it's not earth-shattering information, but it's bringing it all together. So as we re remember from our science classes a long time ago, that um, DNA is transmitted in uh, long sections. These sections are called uh, chromosomes. So it's just not one big piece of DNA that's passed on. It's uh, uh, many different chromosomes. And then uh, we're, re we're reliant upon the reproductive uh, process. I say sex because I was talking to college students, so they perk up better when you say that than uh, reproductive technologies. But we're reliant upon uh, uh, 
<clears throat> the reproductive process to generate new combination of genes and uh, uh, not only individual chromosomes that will be passed on intact, but whole new different combinations of genes, and those genes occur from uh, crossing over. So this is what happens. The, the chromosomes line up, and uh, we have the, the uh, top two um, are examples of the parental chromosomes. And then the, uh, the, the bottom two are examples of new recombinations. So every time those chromosomes line up and you produce new sperm cells, new eggs, half of the time the chromosomes get passed on totally intact, and half of the sign it's a new recombination. So this creation of re new recombinations, new breakages, new linkages, that's what we're really relying on every time we do a flush, every time we get a new animal, every time we genomically test them. We're looking for what specific chromosome got passed on and what new chromosome combination, what new gene combination is uh, being passed on. And, this, and the markers, really all they're doing is just allowing us to track the different chromosome sections that get passed on to the new generation. And <clears throat> what we have here is an example, it comes from uh, USDA, but it's uh, just one chromosome, chromosome 15, and you can see that every, uh, you start off with intact chromosomes, and this is actually uh, from this animal here, old style, the bull. Uh, his chromosome 15, and so if we go back here, we see that there is a uh, breakage and a re new recombination there. One of the parental chromosomes got passed on intact, and then the next generation, there was another break there, and you got a, a new combination of genes, and then there was another break here, and that got passed on. So you, here you have a totally new combination of genes than you, than you had in the previous generation or the previous generation or the previous generation. And that's really what you're doing every time you uh, pick parents, you breed them, you get uh, new offspring and you genomically test. You're trying to see whether you got the winning combination of sections of chromosomes coming in together in an animal and creating something that's even better than the generation before. So this idea of, uh, you know, we've heard it mentioned uh, time and time again, boy, I gotta spend a lot of money on ET, I gotta spend a lot of money on IVF, I gotta spend a lot of money, I gotta spend a lot of money. <laughs> you do, and it's the whole reason is because we are looking for these new combinations that are, that are being created and trying to select the best combination and move forward. So what I'm saying is what you're doing, what you have been doing, what you believe in doing is the right thing. And then we, we follow these uh, old and new haplotypes, these uh, sections of DNA. <clears throat> By the data that we have, the traditional data, we're able to match up the section of DNA with an actual performance and, and get a measure of whether this section of DNA is going to increase protein production or increase longevity, et cetera. And you might notice that uh, we don't have like one dot with, the, with a, uh, a big spike. It's kind of all around there. And that's what George was talking about as far as our ability to get up to 100% reliability. We do a very good job at, at capturing the information that's within a section of DNA and estimating what that section of DNA, how it impacts a certain trait but there's always little errors surrounding about it. We don't get it 100% accurate, we get it, you know, 80, 85% accurate. So when you add up all these little pieces together, we're hoping that we can get up to about 85, 90% reliability, but it's gonna be a long time before we can do a DNA test and have a result that's 100% reliable. We don't see that uh, for some time, and that's, that's what George was explaining. So when we look at uh, how the DNA is transmitted to the next generations, as I mentioned, half of the time whole chromosomes are passed, 50% of the time a new recombination is uh, passed. And so what we are trying to do 
each and individual time that we make a, a new animal, it was, we're trying to look for that new best combination of uh, whole chromosomes and new recombinant chromosomes. And here's the example going back to that bull uh, hill. Bef before, all we had was one number that would explain his overall genetic merit. Uh, so here's uh, net merit dollars. Now we can break it down into what the chromosome is, is worth, what's the chromosome that came from the sire, what's the chromosome that came, came from the, the uh, dam, and add it all up together in order to get our genomic prediction. So rather than having just one single number, we're now able to trace exactly where the inheritance is coming from uh, in past generations. So the science is telling us that there really shouldn't be too many surprises as we go forward. And the science is telling us that the basic logic behind genomic testing and genomic selection is, is sound. And uh, so I, I hope we do have confidence in, in genomics. I certainly do. And the science is there to support um, just doing a better job of being able to know what DNA is actually being transmitted uh, to the next generation. So when people ask, you know, are we going to find major genes? The answer is no. We, we haven't really found uh, many major genes. George gave one example. There are a, a couple of examples, but the, the basic answer is uh, uh, no, we're not finding major genes. And if you were going to search through our entire population and try to find some new outlier genetics, that would be dependent upon some individuals having some major genes that were previously undiscovered. But since there's very few major genes, it's very unlikely that we're going to find something that what a lot of people would consider a real outcross animal, that animal that you have back in, in your barn that nobody has ever come and got excited about because the PTA values uh, haven't been high enough to generate interest. So I just want to um, further convince you that what we are looking for is the best combination of a lot of small genetic effects coming together in the right combination, and then us selecting on them and propagating them further for the next generation. So here we have a list that uh, we just put out. Um, it's the top 50 bulls for protein. I guess my column over here is, <laughs> is, is hard to read. But all, uh, all bulls are tied at the eighth position. They all have the same value, PTA protein of uh, 52 pounds. And what's interesting is to look at how they got that PTA uh, protein of 52 pounds. It's, it's quite, quite different and, and quite uh, diverse. So five bulls all tied. Let's look at uh, uh, two individuals. And uh, uh, I kind of selected this on uh, prefixes. I like this uh, Hendel prefix. Uh, a lot of good animals from, from that herd. But what you see here, I have to get my notes, because it, sometimes I, I forget exactly what, to, what I'm trying to point out. But you have the value of the different genes that are acting on the trait PTA protein, and the value is measured by the height of these lines. And what we see is that the most valuable chromosome for this animal was the ninth chromosome coming from his sire. And then the second one was the number one, also from the sire, number two chromosome from the dam, and the number four chromosome also coming from the dam. So when we look at the, the genetic makeup of this individual, we're actually able to track back to where, which chromosome is contributing, where it's coming from, uh, not only the, the chromosome itself, but whether it's coming from the paternal side of the pedigree or the maternal side of the pedigree. Now, if we look at a, another animal, also 52 pounds of protein, the profile is entirely different. So here we see that the how the genes came together and how it's impacting this animal 
to also have 52 pounds of protein. The best one is chromosome number eight, coming from the sire. And then we have to go over to uh, chromosome 15, coming from the uh, dam, uh, this one here. And then uh, chromosome 14 and chromosome 11. So they're coming from two totally different chromosomes that are giving you the same PTA uh, protein. So when we look at the, uh, <coughs> where the, the chromosomes that happen to have the best combination of a lot of small genes impacting a, tra a trait, they differ totally amongst these five bulls that all have the exact same PTA. And we see that uh, here we have mostly chromosomes uh, one, two, and four. And then here we have totally different chromosomes, 8, 15, 14, 11. And actually, you, you do expect the uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, because the way that uh, chromosomes are numbered, the, the reason that they are numbered the way that they are is that the, the bigger the chromosome is, is labeled number 1, and the smallest chromosome is labeled number 29. So just by the size, you'd expect more good genes to be on a large chromosome than it would be on a small chromosome. So you do expect chromosome uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 to appear here quite a bit. Um, but we do see that uh, we get these other uh, chromosomes that are, are popping up. And I, I like this slide because it also, it makes me think about what is possible, uh, what could be coming down the, uh, uh, in the future. And if you were to think that, well, maybe these are different countries and that they are both selecting for the same overall goal, high protein yield. If we were to, rather than be exchanging all of our genetics together, maybe we would, <coughs> this country here would say, well, let's, let's use this as a primary sire of sun and go real fast, go at genomic speed in this direction. Another country is concentrating on this sire as a sire of sons going off in another direction, you can see that uh, you'd actually diverge rather quickly because here we'd be selecting for chromosome 9, 1, 2, 4, 23. Here we'd be selecting for a total different group of chromosomes, 8, 15, 14, 11, 6. So we'd actually be going in two different directions even though we'd be going after the exact same goal. So when we talk about diversity in the future, I think this is really where diversity in the future is going to be coming from, where the, we're, we're practicing, practicing genomic selection, we're, selection so we're selecting harder and faster, and just because of kind of the random makeup of where the best genes are coming from, what chromosomes they're located on, we're going to see populations starting to, uh, Holstein populations starting to uh, diverse in, in the future. So this is a, my introduction to saying that a lot of the stuff that you are doing today is the correct thing to be doing, and I encourage more of it, and there's a science explanation of, of why it's working. So this is not that unique. This is really what you're doing. You select the best parents. You use ET, IVF to get more recombinations. That's the key. You genomically test those animals. You find the best offspring from the best families. And you just keep doing it over and over and over and over. I mean, that's what we're doing with genomic selection. And the science would, would be saying that we're doing exactly what we should be doing with genomic selection. So the only key point is just to remember that what we're really doing is trying to get as many of the positive haplotypes together in one animal, and that just takes uh, uh, repeating the process many, many times. So the faster genetic progress, when we looked at uh, old technology, we would have just traditional genetic evaluations. AI is a uh, old reproductive technology, so all we've done is the speed a little bit with genomic predictions, more advanced reproductive technology, ET, IVF. 
And this is a nice example of what many of the previous speakers have said, where really what we're, the reason why we're getting faster genetic progress is because we've decreased the generation interval. This is a uh, uh, select size bull, uh, Patty, Patty Rock Prophet. And you can just, and this is kind of like a uh, uh, Zoetis uh, poster boy, because uh, I think uh, 28 of the 30 animals in the pedigree here are, are genotypes, so uh, they're <laughs> genotyping all, all of the animals. And as you can see, this is, this is where we started. This is pre-genomics, and the parents were just about five years of age. Uh, that was standard. And then as soon as we got the genomic information earlier on animals, we started selecting younger animals and quickly decreased the generation interval to where what we have here, when he was born, his parents were only 20 months of age, and that's what the definition of a generation in interval is. What's the age of the parents when the offspring is born? So again, uh, new combinations of DNA sections coming together, that's what's giving us our new genetic material to select upon, and really we're seeking more combinations just to uh, pick the best ones and make more genetic gain. We've talked uh, about um, the distance from real data and how the reliabilities uh, drop. This is, uh, came from uh, just uh, two weeks ago from the uh, interval meeting. And you can see for traditional information, it's, uh, this would be a, a parent average of 28% uh, reliability. Uh, so the parents of this animal would have uh, uh, phenotypes, records, and then uh, this is a parent average. One generation later, it's divided in half to 14. Another generation, uh, again, divided to, uh, in half to uh, 7%. And yes, there is a uh, drop-off when we look at uh, the genomic predictions going from 63% down to 56%, down to 54%. But it's not disastrous as we get further removed from uh, animals that have uh, data. So the genomic predictions, as everybody mentioned, um, you would do like to have the highest TPI numbers closest to animals that have uh, real data, and the further you get away from the animals that have real data, there is a uh, drop-off in reliability, meaning there's a more chance that the uh, uh, genetic values can change, but it's not a, it's not a disastrous uh, drop-off. We have, uh, we, as in the industry, uh, primarily uh, moved forward by uh, USDA. We have a, uh, an active program to find and reduce undesirable genetic characteristics. When we talk about inbreeding, I think that's one of the keys that we're talking about. Well, if we have inbreeding, we're going to have more of these undesirable genetic conditions coming together, and they're going to either be uh, disastrous in that they uh, lead to the death of an embryo, or maybe they're just less disastrous and they lead to reduced milk production or reduced longevity. But there is a uh, active program that uh, um, George explained earlier. I put brachyspiny here, because really what we now call brachyspiny is uh, HH0, but it goes HH0 all the way up to HH5. We have it in the uh, brown Swiss. We have it in, uh, two in the uh, jerseys. So we're finding, we're finding these, and you remember when these first came out, uh, we had uh, Holstein haplopite uh, 1, 2, 3, and then uh, a little while later, 4 and 5. And so the big question is, well, now what? What's going to happen? Are we going to have 6, 7, 8, 21, 22, 23? Uh, how big is that number going to uh, get? And so we have uh, picked up more information on predicting what this number will be. And if you look through what's been written about this, when we first talked about uh, how many undesirable genetic characteristics we think each individual animal or person is carrying, we used the number of three to five. And then a couple of years later, we used the number uh, two to three. And now we're using the number 0.2 to two. So we're really decreasing the, our prediction of how fast 
these haplotypes are going to uh, be found and how many are we going to find? I think we're, we're, we're now at this area of maybe <laughs> each individual animal may have n zero undesirable uh, genetic conditions and some animals will have one, maybe some will have two. But it's much less than we, what we thought previously. And this is probably some of the science that's in the background that we don't uh, really uh, talk about. Um, when we were students in learning genetics, it was a, a golden rule, and the golden rule was that we'd have one gene producing one protein. And we thought that for many, many years. And then with the, the big uh, sequencing of the human genome, we found out, well, we don't have anywhere near as many genes as we thought. We thought we had 100,000 genes or more. It turns out that we have 25,000 genes. And the same thing in cattle, we have 25,000 genes. Yeah, but yet, when we look at the proteins, the number of proteins that uh, are being produced and circulating through us, it's in the 100, 200,000 number. So what that has told us is that there's a lot of built-in redundancy within our DNA, where there's a lot of genes that are producing the same protein, and it can be used uh, at, at different times uh, successfully. So even though we may have a, a flaw in one of our genes, it's not going to lead to a lethal condition because there's another gene that's producing the same, same protein. So that's, that's good news. So we're not going to be finding a whole bunch of undesirable haplotypes. Uh, we will continue to find some more, but the pace of discovery will be, uh, will be slow. So we're doing uh, more in order to get this information to you. This is uh, a Holstein uh, family tree. We're now putting the, uh, the haplotypes on the family tree. So you can see Brachyspina here up to HH5. Uh, we have uh, Blad, CVM, Dumps, Mule, uh, Mulefoot, Pole, Dominant Red, uh, Recessive Red. And it allows you an easier way of, of tracking uh, the haplotypes over time. And also, as we've gone through this genomic error and we've learned more genetics and we're putting it into practice, I hope you realize that rather than having one of these undesirable genetic conditions, it's no longer the kiss of death that it used to be. It's more of an alert to, okay, we have to manage this and reduce this frequency over time. So we don't believe that the top animals should be eliminated sim simply because they have one SNP that we don't like. We have to remember that they have many, many SNPs that we do like. So these animals can still be selected. They can still uh, go into an ET program. You can get a lot of offspring, genomically test, and then over time continue to pass, uh, select the ones that have uh, lower and lower frequency of these uh, undesirable characteristics. So no longer the kiss of death that it used to be, more of a uh, management of the genetic conditions. And then we, we talk about um, uh, genomic inbreeding, and I don't think of an absolute value for what's good, what's a, you know, if you have a low number, what's a, a good low number, or if you have a high number, what's a too, too bad of a, of a number. It's more of the rate of change of genomic inbreeding that uh, we're more concerned about. And the reason is, is that if we're going along at a, at a reasonable pace and the, and the inbreeding level is increasing at a reasonable pace, the breakage in the chromosomes, the new combinations that are coming up, will have some of those combinations that will have uh, that undesirable genetic conditions and we can slowly remove them and others won't and we can slowly increase the frequency of them. So it's not the absolute value of inbreeding on the animal, it's the, uh, the rate that uh, we're, we're increasing at. We mentioned the uh, inbreeding calculator, and uh, that is available. Uh, I think uh, I don't need to talk too much about it. A lot of people have used it, but uh, just so you know, you can enter in uh, a particular female and up to five males and get the uh, genomic inbreeding value on the, uh, on the offspring. And then here's an example of uh, 
how we can use that information. So what I did was I, I picked a bunch of uh, shuttle daughters and then I uh, said, okay, what happens if I bred them to observer? And these are the gen genomic inbreeding values that I got as well as the uh, predicted TPI value uh, for the offspring. And to me, you, could, you can easily see how you could use this type of information. Uh, these animals here, they have high TPI values and low genomic inbreeding values. Those are very good desirable animals to pick and bring into a, a breeding program. And uh, they're exactly what we're looking for as far as moving the, the population forward but having the genomic inbreeding values go up at a, at a slow rate. And they also are, are maybe our new definition of outcross animals. To me, these are our new outcross animals. They're not coming from totally new, different pedigrees. They're, they're the ones coming from the good, high genetic families that have the lowest amount of uh, uh, genomic inbreeding values. So to me, that's what a, a, an outcross, when I, when I hear that term in the genomic era. We talk about our uh, genetic evaluations. Uh, George uh, mentioned how we're going to have a, uh, a one-step uh, evaluation and uh, what can af affect our, uh, uh, that's coming down is uh, the effects of uh, genomic pre-selection. So we currently have a multi-step uh, process. We want to go to a one-step process where we combine all the information together and if we go from one model to another model, there's going to be a change, change in ranking. And uh, so you can ask the question is, well, is anybody really looking at these results and what kind of change are we expecting and is it going to be a change that's going to make me cry or is it going to be one that I can accept and, uh, and move on? So <clears throat> right now we have, uh, um, We've heard about reference populations where we actually are using the information to estimate the uh, SNP effects that goes on to the, uh, predict the uh, genomic predictions of the next generation. So those animals are animals that have both a, a genotype and an actual record. And then in uh, late this year, early next year, we haven't uh, quite figured out, we're going to have what's called the, uh, the single step procedure. So we have, the way to think about it is that we, we, we kind of have three sources of information. We have animals that have traditional data only, we have animals that have genotypes only, and then we have this reference population that has uh, animals with both genotypes and actual information. And the potential problem that we're, we're studying, and I want to uh, make you aware of and uh, uh, tell you a little about uh, the, the uh, whether it'll be a big problem or a little problem, is that we have a lot of animals that are being genomically tested, and then we pick the best ones, then go on to get the uh, traditional information, and then those animals go into the genomic evaluation. So this, this move from genotype only to, so if you have a bunch of young bulls, you genomically test them, you pick the best ones to go on and have progeny. Those progeny have records. That's the cycle that, that, that we're looking at. So <clears throat> we look at the parent average. We genomically test the animals and we get some extra information, how much better or worse they are than their, their parent average. Uh, John called this uh, Mendelian sampling. That tells me that he's a geneticist. Uh, all the geneticists call this Mendelian sampling. Uh, Mendelian, just uh, the, that name comes from Gregor Mendel, the, the father of genetics. Uh, I think farmers would just call this uh, whether the animal has good luck or bad luck. <laughs> uh, but we always say uh, Mendelian sampling. And so what we have is this, uh, the first step where we pick the animals based on their parent average. And here we have the group of bulls, current genomic young bulls, what their traditional parent average is uh, versus the bulls that did not go into AI. So that, uh, you'd expect that, that number to be higher. 
And then these animals were genomically tested. And of course, their genomic value, the reason why they went into AI is because not only did they have high parent average, but they also got good Mendelian sampling or good test re results from the genomic test. And you can see for like net merit that extra good luck or extra Mendelian sampling of the AI bulls was uh, $102 uh, for fat, seven pounds of fat, et cetera. This is giving us, and this is on the USDA website, so you can look at it, and I wanted to bring it forward because I'm not sure that you would know to look at it and then what it meant. And what it means is by quantifying this number, what we were, were fearful of is that the animals will get credit, the bulls, when they get their first, uh, their, uh, progeny test results, they get credit for, for this, but they wouldn't get credit for that extra Mendelian sampling. So the fear, the reason why we've been tracking this, following this, publishing this, is that this is a potential number of a drop that the bulls could have when they go from being a genomic young sire to a progeny tested sire. because they're not getting a, the carryover of this extra information when they go to their uh, progeny test results. So this is, this is the fear, and this is what we've been watching. The fear does not seem to be coming true, because in this era of uh, genomic testing, you collect the bulls, you put out semen, and rather than getting 50 daughters or 100 daughters and having those 100 daughters last for a couple of years and then getting, uh, you know, the second crop daughters and the proof gradually go, goes, goes up. Most of the genomic bulls are coming out and within six months from when the first information appears, they now have thousands of daughters. So we're not expecting what we were fearing of a drop when a bull goes from a genomic test bull to a progeny test bull. We're not expecting, we're actually finding that the bull proofs are gonna be quite stable and it's because of the large number of daughters that the bulls are getting. So if the bull is widely sampled, which uh, most of these genomic bulls are, are widely sampled, in other words, they're getting uh, hundreds of thousands of daughters right out of the gate. Uh, their proofs would actually be quite stable. That's provided that there's no early treatment, uh, early preferential uh, treatment of the daughters. And this is a, another uh, piece of information that's on the USDA website. This is the actual uh, bias that is being uh, seen when we go from uh, uh, genomic evaluations on young bulls to progeny test results is very, very small. Uh, minus one dollar um, net merit, minus two pounds of milk. So the proofs are quite stable. So a, a second uh, area where there's going to be a change coming down the road, we mentioned a new genetic evaluation system that's going to be implemented. Our belief is that uh, the proofs that are going to be the result of the uh, new evaluations are, are going to be uh, quite stable. And what about uh, mates of uh, young bulls? We, we keep uh, wondering whether our evaluations are, are biased. Um, can we look at them? Can we detect any bias? And what's the magnitude of it? So here's a, uh, a Mendelian sampling, the good luck uh, value on uh, heifers that are being uh, tested and uh, selected. Uh, you can see that they're all uh, numbers pretty much in the right direction, higher on net merit, higher on fat, higher on protein, higher on, uh, on other traits. So there is the opportunity that if these heifers are not randomly made it, these elite heifers are not randomly made it to the elite bulls, there could be a, uh, a problem in the uh, evaluation of the young bulls. And this is certainly the case when we look at the percentage of uh, uh, genotyped mates for different individual bulls. So these are bulls here that uh, 90, 100 percent of their mates are genomically tested. Uh, 
the other uh, box, the, the square, 100%, 90% of their daughters are genomically tested. You go down here and you have bulls that, uh, you know, they're only 20% of their mates, 20% of their daughters are genomically tested. So if there's different mating processes that are going on in these high elite uh, animals or those that have a lot of uh, uh, genotyped uh, mates and the offspring, we, we could have the potential uh, for a bias to uh, be introduced. However, what we find is that when we match up the percent genotype mates and the percent genotype daughters with the actual merit of the bull, there's no, no straight relationship here. There's no uh, non-random mating that's occurring of matching up the best uh, good luck heifers, the ones that have the highest Mendelian sampling with the, uh, the highest bulls. And again, that's because the young bulls are being very used very quickly in very high uh, amounts. Uh, there doesn't seem to be a, a pattern by you all of uh, matching the very best. It's the very best of the very best. So you, they're, they're the elite heifers that also have the elite good uh, Mendelian sampling or good test results with a certain particular group of bulls or not with a certain particular group of bulls. So do we expect any drop in the, new, in the evaluations? The answer is no. Um, and uh, we looked at it in August 2013. We looked at it more recently in uh, just this uh, December run. And the average change in the uh, young proof, uh, proofs due to uh, the mates that they're being bred to is only $5 net merit. So we believe that the proofs coming along will be quite stable. I think uh, that's uh, very good uh, news. What about elite families? Do we see any problems in the evaluations of elite families? Do we see some families that uh, we're anticipating a drop, uh, families that we're not anticipating uh, a measure of uh, bias? Uh, again, if I was in the audience and I, I, I'm realizing that there's geneticists all running around, what are they doing, what are they looking at, what are they finding out, and do I need to be concerned about what they're finding out? So here we have, uh, and this is for the elite, elite animals, uh, so we have the situation where you genomically test an animal, you get the genomic test results back, and then if it's much higher or much lower than the parent average value, you decide to keep that animal within the herd and get a uh, production record or cull that animal and not get a production record. So these are elite animals. These are not the uh, Zoetis commercial application where you're actually hoping that the, the owner will get a uh, genomic test and cull the low end. What we're asking is on the elite end, do, you, do the breeders get a genomic test and within that elite category, cull the low end and, and keep the high end? And the answer is no. Their answer probably has to relate to, because we're looking at elite heifers, even though their genomic test comes back and it's a little bit lower than parent average, you're not culling them. You're just not putting them into a flush program. You're, you're putting them back into the herd. They are going on to get records. And uh, that's a good thing because that will not uh, cause any kind of a, a bias to the, uh, the dams and that family's evaluation. So again, uh, another good news uh, result. And when we look at it across all cows and try to average what we uh, believe will be the change with the uh, new genetic evaluation that's uh, coming along, uh, the change is very, very slight. So when we, when we go to this new genetic evaluation system, what we call the single step, because all the information is uh, analyzed together, uh, the good news is little surprises. And uh, I think that's, uh, that's what we would hope for, and uh, that's what uh, all, of the, all of the data is uh, indicating. So the, the third uh, topic that I wanted to talk about is, uh, well, kind of the TPI formula, uh, breeding goals, and uh, uh, where we see our breeding program uh, headed. So many have said today, yesterday, we're in the milk business. We want to 
provide uh, uh, higher volumes of nutritious milk. We want to do that uh, efficiently. And uh, <clears throat> if you want to produce high volumes of milk, it's not just one lactation of, of uh, a lot of milk. It's a high lactation repeated over and over and over again several times. So that comes into the health and fertility. We heard about the uh, improvements in the uh, daughter pregnancy rate, and uh, this is the and uh, Don Bennett talked about the history of uh, cattle breeding, how we focused on uh, production and uh, type, and then uh, we all stepped back and said, "Gee, have we looked at the fertility rates of our cattle? Have we looked at the longevity of our cattle?" And this is not a Holstein issue, this is a dairy cow issue. As we push these cows higher to higher and higher levels of production, we see in all of the breeds, whether it be Jersey or Brown Swiss or Holstein, a decline in, in fertility. What was somewhat surprising with the last base change and the introduction of the uh, new daughter pregnancy rate is that when we look at the change that has occurred, it looks very, very similar. It may be something that went unnoticed, is the scale. Is that before we were talking about a 7% decline in daughter pregnancy rate over this period of time. Now with the new daughter pregnancy evaluations, we're talking about a 14% decline. So the genetic decline in, in fertility is, was uh, much greater than we um, believed. And it's the same for the other breeds. Again, a 14-point decline in daughter pregnancy for both, uh, for essentially all dairy breeds. What I think is very nice, you know, you, ha you have to see what's good. <laughs> so if you look at the other breeds, it's a leveling off at the, at the most recent years. If you look at Holsteins, it's actually an increase in the most recent years. So that's the point to take, uh, uh, the good point to notice. I think that the daughter pregnancy rates, I'm really happy with the new evaluations. It was a uh, change in how we define those traits. Uh, we've now gone to a confirmed pregnancy every 21 days. Uh, so, was, is she pregnant? No. Is she pregnant? No. Is she pregnant? Yes. So that's our new measurement as opposed to just uh, simply uh, uh, days open. So it does a better job of uh, handling differences in voluntary waiting period. That's the way that I, look, when I look at the new DPR values on animals, that's the big difference that uh, uh, jumps out to me as far as why individual bulls changed the way that they did. And the second thing is that the genetics is now uh, much more important. We believe it's much more important of, play, of a role in fertility. We had a, rather than having a 7% decline in fertility in the last 30 years, we now see a 14% that's due to genetics. But that also means that our ability to improve is also greater. So, Again, looking at uh, how the, the trait has changed, um, and uh, if you look at bulls that you believe would have differences in uh, voluntary waiting period, these are high index bulls that were probably uh, daughters were put into an ET program, so they, were, they didn't really start being bred until later on in their uh, lactation, and you see a dramatic uh, change in the up direction, and these are, this is a big change, remember, because this is, um, this is before the base change, so we expected these numbers all to drop, but rather than drop, they went up in December uh, after the base change. You have a bowl like uh, Gold Chip, whoops, excuse me, uh, gold chip that uh, again uh, would, would uh, daughters would probably have been left open, looking to uh, achieve a, a 365 day record, and uh, that's now being better accounted for in the new uh, DPR values. So we have uh, our ability to improve fertility is greater. We see a much stronger relationship between uh, daughter pregnancy rate and uh, TPI values. And when we look at uh, the 
the fertility values, the daughter pregnancy values on the high TPI animals, uh, they're, they're higher. There's a lot more positive numbers among the top animals. Uh, the belief is that uh, with all those positive numbers, we're going to be making faster improvement for fertility, and it's going to be easier. So the question is, well, if that's the case, we need to reevaluate the TPI formula and, and evaluate how much emphasis should we be putting on production, how much emphasis should we be putting on uh, fertility. So the, the uh, discussion is uh, reopened. So again, uh, we're looking for a high production, but we're looking for high production uh, per day of life. And it's kind of two different ways you can get that. You can get that by selecting for the production PTAs, protein and fat, individual lactation records, or try to get repetitive lactations of high production uh, time after time. So we've introduced a new uh, index, our fertility index. Uh, listening to all the discussions about body size, I probably should have focused on feed efficiency, but I picked uh, fertility index. And it has uh, the heifer conception rate, the cow conception rate, the daughter pregnancy rate. But what it's doing is it's allowing us to uh, have the heifers uh, settle easier, sooner, when you want them to. Uh, Dan Weigel talked about this yesterday. Uh, we certainly uh, believe in those numbers. Uh, when you look at the uh, cows, the daughter pregnancy rate, the big value, big information that's in there is when these cows start cycling after uh, freshening. Uh, cow conception rate is uh, self-explanatory. But the whole fertility index is allowing us to identify uh, ways or, or allow us to get more cows pregnant when we want to get them pregnant and uh, culling fewer cows because they're, they're open. And we always like looking at real numbers. Um, does this have a real economic impact? So I looked at uh, actual numbers on a, a herd in New York and uh, was just looking to see if we were to improve the fertility index of, this, of the cows within the herd, uh, breed for them to have higher production, would that, how would that affect lifetime milk production? And you can see that it, it goes up. The animals that have higher fertility are actually the animals that produce more uh, milk over their lifetime. So what this is telling us is that what's hold, these animals here in the, in the bottom quartile, they actually produce more on an individual lactation as opposed to the uh, high fertility. That makes sense. But these animals are being held back from continually producing at a high level one lactation, two lactation, three lactation, four lactation. They're being held back because they're not getting pregnant. Some of them are being culled. So when you look at the whole herd on lifetime production, it's actually the animals that have the high fertility that's producing higher lifetime uh, milk uh, production. So it certainly is a, a balance in any kind of uh, selection index of how much emphasis do we put on increasing production and how much emphasis do we put on uh, increasing fertility. So since we have these new daughter pregnancy rates, there's a new opportunity to open up the discussion of how much emphasis on production, how much emphasis on fertility, uh, what should be the weighting in, in our TPI formula. Uh, we've, we're looking at this uh, topic. And as I said, uh, we do want high production uh, per, uh, per lactation, but we want several lactations of, of uh, high production. So a nice goal to uh, look at is uh, high production per day of life. And that's a uh, measure that uh, we've been focusing on in our latest uh, TPI uh, discussions. And I want to show you the, uh, just where I'm getting my uh, information. Uh, <clears throat> we talk about uh, productive life and whether, whether that's a real number. <laughs> and uh, that is a little bit surprising because it is a real number. It's just telling us how many months is the cow actually producing milk. We have a, uh, another information, piece of information that comes from uh, USDA, and it's the standardized uh, lactation record. So this is a uh, 2x305 mature equivalent record. 
Uh, so that's coming from USDA. So if you want to measure lifetime production, um, it's just taking that standardized record. Um, it's for a 305 day record, so 10 months. You divide it by 10. You know how much uh, milk the cow is producing per month. You know how many months of milk the cow is producing. You multiply those together and you come up with uh, uh, the 131,550, which is very nice when you look at the actual production on the exact same cow. Uh, you, you say, well, this is the actual production in the first lactation, second lactation, third lactation, fourth lactation, and then a partial fifth lactation adds up to 131,550. Now, of course, this is, the, this is one of the best examples to show. <laughs> but it comes close uh, when you do it uh, 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 on many, many animals. The thing is, is that this information here I had at the Holstein Association on those animals that uh, paid an extra uh, fee to have a 365 day or complete lactation uh, transmitted to the Holstein Association. So we have actual total lifetime uh, production on some of our animals and then on all animals we would have uh, the USDA information on both uh, productive life and, uh, oops, excuse me, and uh, uh, standardized uh, milk yield. So <clears throat> what I was trying to get at is that if we we're going to have a goal of selecting for higher uh, lifetime uh, production per day of life, what's better? Should we go for a high individual lactation? And I, Don Menick, you always have to have at least one sport slide in here, so this is my sports slide. So this is like a, a big uh, individual lactation record, a three-point shot. Very impressive, um, and you can score points that way with uh, uh, a three-point shot, or you can move a little bit uh, closer to the basket and score two points, but probably score the two points more times. So this is what I'm thinking about as far as a high individual lactation record. This is uh, what I'm thinking about as far as uh, improving the fertility, just doing it more and more often, uh, maybe not as high, but doing it more and more often. So when we looked at this uh, combined fat and protein per day of life, uh, the individual traits, how they relate to it, uh, PTA type is, is positively related to it, uh, and then you go uh, as you go down, the importance grows. So PTA type, the way that I, I look at it is that uh, unless you have good udders, good feet and legs, you're going to be holding back your cows from having a large lifetime production yield. So good type, good conformation is important and it is related to uh, uh, combined fat protein per day of life. But even more important um, in achieving a higher uh, lifetime uh, yield is daughter pregnancy rate, uh, as we see a higher correlation. The fertility index, which takes into account a little bit uh, extra information on the heifers and the cow conception rate, uh, boosts it up to uh, higher. If you were to pick the traits that are most related to lifetime yield per day of life, it would be production. But the, the task that we have, all, any of us that are talking about an index, is how do we combine both the fertility and the individual lactations to come up with an index, a total performance index, that would maximize uh, fat and protein per day of life. And that's what the TPI trying, is trying to do, is, is pull all of these traits together in the right combination, the, the right weighting, so that we uh, maximize uh, uh, profitability. And then the, the, the actual information that I'm using, so this is all actual information on cows. These cows are born between 2007 and 2009. And you kind of have to pick a little bit of a, an older group of animals because they have to have the opportunity to have actually uh, uh, lived out their, their lives. So we believe that TPI is currently doing a nice job. And then when we have discussions on whether we should change things one way or the other, um, I think, as I mentioned, our fertility values are much better than what they were six months ago. Uh, so this may give us the opportunity to put more weight on production. 
If we do it at this point in time, it doesn't look like that's the right thing to do because the correlation with uh, production per day of life actually drops a little bit if we increase the production component relative to the fertility component. And if we put even more increased emphasis on production, that correlation drops even more. So at this point in time, I think our TPI formula is doing the right job as far as balancing production and fertility, productive life, those measures of having repeated lactations over and over again. So on the short, short term, I think we're going to be staying uh, with the TPI formula that we've, we've announced, uh, and it will be implemented in uh, April. It's just a, uh, a slight uh, modification from the one that's uh, currently being used, the December one, uh, just taking into account the change that was uh, implemented in daughter pregnancy rate and the standard deviations that uh, changed. Longer term, um, as fertility goes up, the genetic improvement in fertility goes up, that means that fertility will be holding us back less and less and less, and we'll be able to put more and more emphasis back onto uh, uh, production. So I definitely see the, you know, all these formulas need to evolve over time, and they need to evolve depending upon the characteristics of our population. And as I said, we see fertility going up, which means that that will hold the cows back less from repeating high production successively, which means over time you'll see changes in the TPI formula uh, that will place a little bit more emphasis on uh, production. So maybe you can use this information in the sale tonight when you say, oh, gee, this animal uh, you know, has good fertility numbers, but the fer production's quite high. Over time, this family's going to go up. But when, I'm not sure. <laughs> so that's uh, an update of uh, changes that are coming along. Um, Hopefully I've given you an update of what's coming. Hopefully the, the, there's not too many surprises and, the, and that uh, the information will actually make you feel more confident in the uh, genetic information that's out, out there as opposed to less confident in, in the current genetic information. Thanks, Tom. I think certainly, uh, you, know, it, you know, addressing a lot of the issues that, uh, that you bring forward, it's, um, the things haven't changed in the respect of, you know, why do cows get removed from herds? And it's used, it comes right down to the two issues that you address, uh, you know, right on the head is production and reproduction and comes down to affecting the profitability of the, of the cow and of the farm. And I think those, those two things are the ones that get the most attention. And uh, certainly it's uh, great to see how, how it influences the, uh, the, uh, the GTPI equation you know, so positively as well. So I think you certainly addressed that uh, so comfortably. Any questions for, for Tom at, uh, at this time? We've, we're kind of coming into our final steps and we've certainly had a couple great days. And I think when you, you know, have Tom's information, you know, kind of coming to a closure on, on the improvements that we've made. And uh, I think you've easily said that change is inevitable. It's going to continue, but uh, certainly in, in such a progressive way as well. So any questions for, for Tom at this time? And I think uh, it was great that uh, Tom's flight got canceled, so he is going to be here for the sale. And, and that, was, that was my surprise, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I think you can easily indicate which uh, lots he's got started for this evening. So um, that's great. So Tom is going to be here. Um, Paul, thank you. Yep. Sorry, Paul. Just one question, Tom. Um, the voluntary waiting uh, period, can you expand a little bit how that's calculated? Uh, that was a question that came up at the Wisconsin Forum here several weeks ago. Thanks, yeah. Paul. Yeah. Um, so the, uh, you know, this, we get, uh, USDA gets information on uh, the uh, conception rate and uh, when cows are being bred. That's me, and that's on a, a percentage of the, uh, the cows. I don't know, probably about 60% of the cows would have that type of information. 40% would not have individual reproductive events uh, recorded. So for those 40% where you don't have that information, you're still relying upon uh, looking at a, uh, uh, the next lactation when the cow calves to back, back calculate as far as when she was actually uh, uh, bred. And then as far as the voluntary waiting period, if you have a, uh, 
<coughs> you, the assumption that's being made in those calculations of days open um, is that all of the cows within the herd have the same voluntary waiting period. Uh, that probably is not the case, and that was the improvement that we see when we do have information on just how long was that on an individual cow that's now being taken into account in the new DPR calculations where it really was uh, having only a minor impact in the old daughter pregnancy rate calculations. As well, it, it does uh, change a little bit the cows over 250 days in milk as well. Does Did you incorporate that as yeah, well? Yeah, yeah. That was a, a, a change uh, before um, at the... Uh, if you look at uh, uh, 250 days in milk and uh, you are missing information on whether the cow is actually uh, pregnant or not, the old DPR calculations was saying, oh, well, she made it all the way to 250 days. We're assuming she's pregnant. And now the new calculations are saying, well, she's, <laughs> she's at 250 days. We don't know whether she's pregnant or not. We're assuming that she's open. And... Uh, yeah, a couple of valuable changes. Uh, Brian? So, Tom, um, near the end of your presentation, you were talking about TPI, and the, I am assuming those were correlations yes. related to uh, lifetime cumulative yields of fat and protein. Um, I'm trying to correlate that or associate that with the work that we've been doing at CDN in profit, and it's a very similar kind of in a way, there's an analogy, there's similar kind of analysis going on. What I'm not catching is why there's such a big difference between the correlations that you're getting versus what we're getting. In other words, I expect our formula for LPI, TPI are very similar, but the correlations that we're getting are very vastly different. So something's, something's missing in there that I'm not catching or quite understanding. I mean, if yours is 36%, ours is 73%, so I'm not sure not Are sure you what, looking at genetic values or? Uh, mm -hmm. Well, the correlation between the phenotypic value, so it's lifetime, lifetime profit, which you're assuming to be lifetime profit, is based on the cumulative kilos of fat yeah, and protein. So, yeah, so maybe that's, we're, that's similar to what we would have. We yeah, would have some expenses. We're, we're and, looking at uh, the genetic information and how that relates to yeah. the actual... That's exactly what I mean, too. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so that's exactly what I mean. The genetic index is like a TPI correlated to the profit of their daughters, which is the kilos of fat and protein. So I don't know where it's coming from, but I was just curious uh, whether they were correlations or R squareds or something. Yeah, like. correlations. Yeah. But okay. I think that um, if I understand, you are also somewhat coming to the same conclusion as far as uh, whether you should be increasing the emphasis on fertility. And my understanding is that you are thinking of doing that in the new well, LPI. Well, our LPI will be always for the past two years have felt that we needed to move that health and fertility component from 15 to 20 percent. Holstein Associated decided that two years ago already. Yeah. Their only issue was where to take it from. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but in the development of our new profit index, it's, uh, it's even clearer there. So when you really want to define profit, then we need to put more weight on both mastitis and the functional traits and fertility and all those. Yeah. Yeah. 